Welcome back to the channel. There's a new paper out there in the Lancet Child and Adolescent Health. It is provocative. It's a bombshell. It's the first paper I'm aware of that looks at kids and young men and young adults who have recently had mRNA-induced myocarditis, vaccine-induced myocarditis, and follows them more than 90 days after that event to see how they are doing. And this paper is titled, Outcomes at Least 90 Days Since the Onset of Myocarditis After mRNA COVID-19 Vaccination in Adolescents and Young Adults in the USA, a follow-up surveillance study. And the authors are out there on social media. I see they're trying to downplay, and throughout the manuscript, they try to downplay the severity of this. They say it's mostly a reassuring study. You'll be the judge of that by the end of this. I've pulled out what I think are the most important important points uh, with some caveats and some provisos, but I want to walk you through these results. I think they're really important to think about the safety of mRNA vaccines in adolescents and uh, young adults. So here we go. This is how they write the implications. This is the box at the beginning of the Lancet paper. This is what they say. It says myocarditis after mRNA COVID-19 vaccination is rare but potentially serious. I think I don't dispute that to be true. The question is how rare, and the answer is in the key demographics, we're probably talking one in 3K to one in 5K, um, and that has been severely underestimated in some prior analyses, um, but it's, it's, it's real. I mean, one in 3,000 is not common. It is rare, but it is also not dismissible. To better understand possible long-term sequela of myocarditis and continued follow-up is important, particularly for the patients not recovered by at least 90 days since symptom onset. Vaccination remains the most effective way of preventing morbidity and mortality from COVID-19. Well, that last sentence, I think, is uh, something that kind of goes beyond this paper, which is what is the risk-benefit balance for this target group? And I think it's very different from one dose to two doses to three doses. I think it might be different based on prior infection with COVID-19. So for instance, a 20 year old who had three doses and just had BA5, what's the risk benefit proposition for them, for that person, particularly a man, a 20 year old man to get the new bivalent booster? I think it might be different than what was the risk benefit balance to a say overweight diabetic 16 year old in the beginning of the pandemic, uh, back in maybe February or March of 2021. That might have been a different calculation to get the first dose, somebody who had never had COVID-19. So I think, you know, even the takeaway point is already telling you the way the authors are leaning, but let's just look at the raw data. You know, the raw data speaks for itself. So what is this? This is the study design and population. It says, in this follow-up surveillance study, we included U.S. patients who were at age 12 to 29 at the time of mRNA COVID vaccination and for whom the time to myocarditis symptom onset was more than 90 days since vaccination and a VAERS report was filed, that's the vaccination passive surveillance system, uh, between January 12th and November 5th, 2021. I think there's a typo in this, actually. They're not looking at people for whom the time to myocarditis symptom onset was more than 90 days since vaccination. No, no, no. They're looking at people, I've corrected it a little bit below, where the time from symptom onset to the study cutoff was more than 90 days. In other words, if, it, if, the, if the myocarditis occurred more than 90 days after the shot, I don't think anyone's going to be attributing it to the shot. They'll be looking for other explanations. These myocarditis events occur much sooner than that. We know that to be true. But this is a study that follows those people for at least 90 days. That's different than saying that the symptom onset of myocarditis began more than 90 days after the shot. I think there's some typo in this and probably missed by many, many authors, reviewers, editors. It happens. I mean, it happens in, in the literature. Few people are reading it very closely. Actually, most people are not reading it at all. That's the sad part. Let me go further. So here are the key results. Between January 12th and November 5th, there was 989 cases of myocarditis after mRNA COVID vaccine. Uh, they were reported to VAERS and met the CDC's case definition of myocarditis. Uh, this is, if anything, is an under-report. There are lots of cases that are not getting captured in the system, but it is what it is. Of these, 85% of patients were at least 90 days post-myocarditis onset. Of these, uh, 204 patients had no telephone number available for contact. Oh, that sounds like a brilliant surveillance system where, you know, I don't really know their telephone number. Bravo, United States, 2021. Bravo. That's the kind of state of science we're offering. Our passive surveillance systems are junk. We need to do a better job. I mean, if we don't have the phone number for a quarter of the people, this is em embarrassing. 31% um, of patients were unreachable. Of the remaining 375 patients, 357 consented to the survey and 18 patients declined. So that's what we're getting. I don't have any reason to think that the people who are consenting are different than the people who are not consenting, but I do have some reason to think that the people who are even captured in this whole, you know, 
uh, selective filter might be a little bit different than all of the kids out there with myocarditis because it's not just any kid who had myocarditis. It's a kid who had myocarditis who went to a hospital where the doctor had the wherewithal to report it to theirs. Um, so if I were to suspect, I, 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 would, I would bet, I don't know this to be true, but I would bet that these kids are probably of slightly higher socioeconomic status, slightly higher, going to slightly um, more classically prestigious hospitals, and, and, and perhaps uh, the doctors have more wherewithal than the kids who had myocarditis who are not in this data set. And the kids who had myocarditis, but there wasn't a phone number in the chart for these people to trace. Um, I would suspect that this is a, somehow a different fraction of kids, and there'll be some socioeconomic uh, interactions there. The median interval from myocarditis onset to survey completion was 143 days. Okay, so we're getting some decent follow-up for the healthcare provider portion of this. So they're asking both the patient, the person who had the symptoms, and the healthcare provider is 191 days. So we're getting some, you know, maybe six month, nearly six month follow-up here. Here's the key takeaway. 61 out of 393 kids, according to the healthcare provider, 16% had not fully recovered. So you can say most kids recover from myocarditis after mRNA vaccine but not all kids. We're talking about one in six kids has not fully recovered. And four out of these kids, 1% of them, were literally no better. They're saying that they're literally about the same as they were when they had the, the peak event. This, to me, is actually extremely bad news. I mean, this is... This means that you took a healthy kid who was um, otherwise doing just fine, and we're talking one in six of them have long-term sequela of myocarditis more than 90 days out after vaccination, and, and I, don't, I don't quite like that. <coughs> In the two weeks before the survey date, 50% of the 357 patients reported having at least one system, one symptom that might occur with myocarditis, chest pain or discomfort, fatigue, shortness of breath, or palpitations. Um, you know, that's 50% of kids more than 90 days out. You know, um, yes, we don't have a clear control what ought it to be, um, but, you know, it does, uh, it does suggest that these kids have... Uh, persistent symptoms, and there's going to be some other indices that come that you really won't be able to argue with. Um, of 357 patients surveyed, 267 were enrolled in school or in paid employment, and 16% of whom reported missing school or work days in the two weeks before the survey date. Of those 43 patients, one in three, 35% of them believed it was associated with myocarditis. So, I mean, that's a real thing happening. What exactly is the cause of it? You can speculate about whether or not it is underlying anxiety, depression, or whether or not it is the sequela of this event, or whether or not this event caused anxiety, which caused a missed school. So it's not the direct cause of the heart, but rather the heart leading to all these other problematic things. But whatever you want to say about it, we're talking about some kids are missing school 90 days out, and they're attributing that to the fact that this happened to them. Okay? Whether it's mediated through anxiety and depression, or whether or not it's a direct consequence of the of the uh, uh, vaccine effect on the heart, I think that can be debated. But you can't argue with the fact that these kids are saying that this is what's keeping them out of school. It would be nice to have some control groups here. I will be the first to concede that to you. A control of you know what is the rate with which kids blame antecedent injury or illness on on absenteeism. Here's another way to look at it. This is health-related quality of life. There are some kids reporting a proportion of the people who are reporting this. Difficulties, any problems in self-care, mobility, usual activities, pain, and anxiousness and depression. You can see it's much more common for anxiousness and depression. Of course, this age group, their lives have been so disrupted. It wasn't great to begin with. Pre-pandemic either, there's going to be anxiety and depression. But it's hard to argue with that it's affecting your self-care, your mobility, your usual activities. And there's going to be a whole bunch of evidence coming soon that you will not be able to question or argue with. All right. This is categorized based on patients who have fully or probably recovered. That's the first column. Patients not recovered, that's the second column. And the patients with unknown recovery status. What is the highest level of care? You know, 66% and 62% were hospitalized with no intensive care. But that means, you know, one in four of these people, these kids were hospitalized requiring intensive care. Um, only a few were managed as an outpatient. One person who's not recovered had to get intensive care with ECMO. That's extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. Let me put it this way. That's as serious as it gets. If you're having vaccine-induced myocarditis that causes you to be on ECMO, I think that's a very, very serious complication. What about patient restrictions on physical activity? At the time of initial diagnosis, you see 83 and 82% of kids had, I'm just calling them kids, but we're talking about 12 to 30, so you call it whatever you want, kids and young adults. Um, we're talking about 83% had restrictions on physical activity placed on them initially. But even at the time of the last healthcare follow-up, the people who have fully or probably fully recovered, one in four of them have restrictions placed on their daily activity. What kind of full recovery is it? 
if I can't go for a run or a jog and I'm a 24-year-old man, is that a full recovery? So I'm quibbling with a little bit with the definitions. But when it comes to the people who are not fully recovered, 50% of them, 48% of them are having still having persistent restrictions on their physical activity. Okay? I don't know what to say. I mean, in terms of people who are not fully recovered, only one in three has been cleared for physical activity. Um, this is concerning. I mean, this is an impact on your life. And you're not going to be able to say that this is the anxiety or the depression causing this. This is a doctor's opinion. This is a cardiologist's opinion. And you might argue that, well, that opinion is not evidence-based. Maybe they'd be able to go out there and exercise. That would be okay. But the reality is that's not the way the world is right now. And this is impacting their lives because they're being told they're not allowed to do this. This is the part that I don't think anyone can quibble with. These are what they're actually taking. These kids and young adults are swallowing these pills. They are swallowing these pills. These pills are not to treat anxiety. They're not to treat depression. They're not to treat school closure. They're only to treat cardiac problems, okay? Let's look at the pills. The pills are ACE inhibitors, diuretics, corticosteroids, ARBs. They are colchicine beta blockers, NSAIDs and aspirin. This is what they're taking. If you're quote unquote fully recovered or probably fully recovered, 3% of them are still taking an ACE. 10% of them are taking colchicine. 9% of them are taking a beta blocker. Full recovery, but you know, a young man has to take a beta blocker for who knows how long. It's a full recovery, really. I mean, I think that that suggests that things aren't going as good as they would be if you weren't to have had the myocarditis. Let's look at the patients not fully recovered. Um, you know, we're talking about 20% of people taking an ACE or an ARB. 5% are taking a diuretic. A young, healthy person taking a diuretic, okay? That's a big deal to me. Uh, one in four is taking colchicine. 20% are taking beta blockers. 14% uh, taking NSAIDs or aspirin. This is a big deal. This is a big deal to take a 22-year-old healthy man and put him on a beta blocker colchicine and furosemide because he feels fluid overloaded. To put him on furosemide, okay? This is a big deal. This cannot be attributed to any underlying anxiety or, or mental health issue. This must be attributable to the direct effect of the vaccine on the heart muscle, okay? And I urge anyone to try to argue with this. How else, how else can you explain these things? That somebody is taking colchicine, that somebody is taking, and of course they have an extended taper, who knows what happened if, you, if they tried to end the colchicine sooner, that somebody is taking diuretics. What is the explanation for that? I find it very, very problematic. This is where it gets even more concerning to me. In the 10 patients with abnormal ambulatory rhythm monitoring results, we found eight had atrial supraventricular or ventricular arrhythmia, three had conduction delay or block, five had frequent atrial or ventricular ectopy. Of these 10 patients, three had evidence of late gadolinium enhancement on follow-up MR, of which three had evidence of late gadolinium, uh, of, sorry, of the three with evidence of late GAD enhancement, two had evidence of an atrial supraventricular or, or ventricular arrhythmia. What is this telling you? This is telling you and it's going to be very difficult for people to deny that there is a fraction of these kids who are going to be left with some scar in the heart. And that scar is a precipitant for reentrant circuits and arrhythmia. And I don't know if anyone will be able to walk this away from that conclusion that not everybody, it is a small percentage, but it is a real percentage. And we are not talking about an 85 year old who, if they had met COVID-19, the outcome would have been horrific. We are talking about a 12 to 29 year old healthy person walking away with permanent permanent uh, arrhythmic and arrhythmogenic events. Uh, that to me is concerning, deeply concerning. It goes further. This is more of a, a table breaking down uh, the late GAD enhancement, GAD enhancement edema, while motion abnormalities are present in some people. I'll let you read that uh, at your leisure. <clears throat> it's not good. This is one thing that blew me away in the paper. Evidence of ongoing myocarditis. We're talking more than 90 days out. Ongoing myocarditis? Are you serious? Defined by both late GAD enhancement and edema using the modified Lake Louise criteria was uncommon, but it's in 20 out of 151 people who could be, who could be assessed by cardiac MR. Uh, uncommon, but not absent, and still in 13% of the people who are getting the cardiac MR, ongoing myocarditis, this is a deep concern. What are, we, what are we talking about here? And keep in mind, every single data point in this analysis is passive. This is all passive data collection. In other words, they're not taking these kids. They're not enrolling them in a protocol. They're not routinely doing things. They're not creating a control group and doing the same tests in the control group, healthy kids who didn't develop myocarditis, for instance. 
um, or healthy kids who didn't get vaccinated might be another interesting control group. They're not doing any of that. They are actually doing whatever the doctor decided was necessary to do and just collecting that information. And that is likely just the tip of the iceberg. And that is not good. I mean, I don't think meeting the modified Lake Louise criteria 90 days out would be considered by anyone to be good. And here's how they conclude. Myocarditis after mRNA COVID vaccination is rare yet potentially serious. I agree with that. Although most patients were considered recovered by healthcare providers at least 90 days since onset, nearly half of patients continued to report self-reported symptoms, including chest pain, and a quarter were prescribed daily cardiac medications. You can argue that there are many reasons why people might have chest pain, but you cannot argue that somebody on furosemide, colchicine, a beta blocker, and an ACE, their life was impacted. You cannot argue that a doctor telling somebody that you're not allowed to exercise 90 days out is a deep impact on their life. And then one must wonder which came first, the anxiety and then the quality of life decrement or the fact that doctor told you you can't exercise and then the anxiety, okay? Which is coming first? What is the causal pathway here? These findings suggest that continued follow-up and assessment of myocarditis after mRNA COVID vaccine is needed to more fully understand recovery after vaccine-associated myocarditis. Could not agree more. I could not agree more. <clears throat> My other thought there is that it's delinquent that the CDC and FDA have not created a prospective cohort that's more actively assessing this information. Okay, the meaning of the cardiac MRI findings among the subset of patients who received cardiac imaging is unclear. Evidence of ongoing myocarditis on follow-up based on modified Lake Louise criteria was uncommon. However, consistent with the very few published case series of myocarditis after mRNA vaccination, we observed that nearly half of patients with follow-up cardiac MRs had residual late gadolinium enhancement suggestive of myocardial scarring. They're walking around with a scar in the heart. I don't think there's any cardiologist who's going to be very comfortable with a 20-year-old walking around with that, especially when you start to get hints that it will precipitate an arrhythmia. What are you going to do for these kids? I would be... T I, I'll avoid further comment on this. I'm not a fan of this finding. Although late GAD enhancement during the acute episode of myocarditis has been shown in children and adults to be a possible indication of future adverse cardiac events, including arrhythmia, ECMO, transplantation, and death. The importance of late GAD enhancement noted on follow-up cardiac MRs in patients with viral, my viral myocarditis is unclear. This is not viral myocarditis. This is vaccine-induced myocarditis. It is, I agree with you, it is unclear, but I certainly wouldn't put it in the pot of things that I'm very optimistic about. I'm gonna put it in the pot of things that I'm very, very worried about and very deeply concerned about walking around with late GAD enhancement. And by the way, some of us knew this from the outset. We were talking about this, that this is a potential risk. When people were playing the little game of dismissing all of this as it's mostly mild myocarditis, we said, I always told many reporters, this is a distribution. These events happen across a distribution. It may be mostly mild, but it's stochastic. There's gonna be some events that are much worse. There's one kid who's on ECMO, for Christ's sakes, and there's some people who are gonna have scar and long-term damage. That's the nature of serious adverse events, that they will follow a distribution. A second limitations of the study is passive nature of VAERS reporting. Some U.S. cases of myocarditis associated with mRNA vaccination will not have been reported. Oh, you think? Oh, good, good. I've, I'm glad you, you understand that. All right. That's the end of my slideshow. I'm going to give you a few closing thoughts. My closing thoughts are the following. I don't fault anybody for initially embarking on a vaccination strategy and finding an unknown safety signal. I think that was bound to happen. It was possible it happened. I don't fault anyone for that. So from December and January of December 2020, January 2021, I'm not faulting anyone for those two months. February 2021, we had the Jerusalem Post story that the Israelis said that there's myocarditis. It was mostly in 16 to 19 year old men who were getting this shot. From that moment, I will argue, and I have argued in many op-eds and many long-form pieces, that the U.S. did not take myocarditis seriously. Rochelle Walensky was quoted many months later saying, we've looked at 200 million cases, we've not seen a signal. That couldn't possibly be true because the signal was there and the signal was evident. It was investigated by the EMA in May, and by the summertime, we clearly knew this was a real safety signal. Even if you were to forgive them for a few months delay while they sorted things out, when the moment they saw was a real safety signal, you need to take seriously safety in a low, lower risk group as seriously as you took bringing the vaccine to market in the first place. We needed randomized trials, testing different dose levels, 
of this vaccine, lower doses in adolescent boys, lower doses in younger people. We needed to rethink the booster strategy. Maybe we didn't need the booster strategy in young men, any young man, 20 year old man who had a booster and booster induced myocarditis. You know, you really have to wonder. We needed to start to think about whether or not there should be carve outs for people with natural immunity, whether or not you could space the doses further apart. Norway did that. It took us another year to act upon that information, whether or not Moderna was more risky than Pfizer. That was true. Ontario data showed that. We could have banned Moderna on men under 40. We didn't do the things we were supposed to do to take safety seriously. We continued to, and by we, I mean the administration, not me. I was one of the few people who really understood that this was an important safety signal. You have to take the safety seriously because regulatory science is not a one-time interaction. It's a game of reputation. The reputation is hard fought and earned over decades. And this administration just was spending the reputation, relentlessly spending it in a in a one size fits all pursuit of booster policies that benefit the company, but not clear that they benefit these young people. Even when Gruber and Krauss, the two people at FDA resigned over their zealotry on boosters, they still refused to take this seriously. I still believe they're not taking it seriously. This publication should have been discussed at the Bivalent Booster Committee. It was not. I'm very concerned about this. I think that there's going to be, I mean, I know what's going to happen. Right now, people are still in the passions of COVID-19. They're not thinking clearly. They're using the part of the brain that's rotten and is affected by emotions, not the reasonable, rigorous part of the brain. It's very difficult to focus on the reasonable part of the brain in times when you are concerned about your health and you're stressed. But what will happen is as time goes on, reason will prevail. And people will look back on this episode and they will identify exactly as I have. The paper trail is as long as it comes. We have everything documented in the news media, when the decisions were made, what they knew at the time. And they will say very clearly that this was a failure of the FDA. I suspect the Government Accountability Office will investigate. They will write two things. One, the White House had undue influence on the FDA, leading to the resignation of two important people who would have safeguarded public health. The FDA had a un- had a unyielding focus on one-size-fits-our booster strategies without taking the safety of adolescent young men into account, and also some women in this study, but mostly men, uh, and, and didn't do what it takes to mitigate the harm of this. This was a preventable... Uh, maybe not entirely preventable, but certainly ameliorable, certainly something you can improve upon. And the goal of vaccination campaigns is to vaccinate, but as safely as possible. You got to take vaccination seriously. You got to take safety seriously. That's the social contract. You can't give up the safety part. And I fear they have. Many of us worried about late GAD enhancement and what that means. We still don't know. The jury's still out. And you can argue that some of the symptoms people are feeling might be due to all the stuff that's going on in society, maybe not the myocarditis per se. Some of it might be due to the fact that they got a shot and they got myocarditis. That's attributable to myocarditis. But what you cannot argue with is that these people are taking these cardiac meds. We're talking about roughly one in four. And you're, and some kids are still facing restrictions on their daily activities. And that, to me, is absolutely untenable. So this paper I view as very concerning. It is a fragmented, incomplete snapshot with poor controls. The fact that we don't have a better study conducted under the auspices of CDC reflects another way in which they failed because they're failing to collect data. They have failed so many times. I have so little respect for them. I'm going to leave this pandemic with nearly no respect for them and anyone who made these decisions. And what that means is it makes my life harder because I already had a lot of things that I want to read about and really understand fully to make decisions in my own life and to really know the answer because I like to know the answer. Now, thanks to them and the way in which they do things, I'm going to have to read a whole lot more things because I want to understand even more. So those are my thoughts on this important Lancet Child and Adolescent Medicine paper. That's it. That's what you get on this channel, a professor, epidemiologist, practicing doctor, giving his thoughts on the literature, unbiased. I like to call it like I see it. I am just being totally straightforward with you. This is how I view the issue. Uh, It's nuanced. It's in the middle. It's not uh, one extreme or the other. That's the way science is. That's the way evidence is. So if you like this video, you know what to do. Like, subscribe, comment, leave a message below. Go back and watch some other videos on the bivalent booster. Watch a video on uh, whether or not the pandemic's over. And uh, until next time.